Okay, I am so excited. Today I have City Councilor Sarah Kirby Young with us. Sarah began her public service with the Vancouver Park Board in 2014, and she became her first term elected City Councilor in 2018 and is currently sitting as an independent. It's important for our listeners to know that Sarah comes to this conversation with a great deal of education. She's got a Bachelor's of Arts degree from UBC in Psychology and a minor in French. Très bien. Um, mar <laughs> marketing management diploma from BCIT and uh, her most recent was of course her MBA that you got in public relations and communications from Royal Roads University. In Sarah's own words, she's committed to a livable and vibrant Vancouver. Her priorities include housing, small business and a sustainable economy. She's passionate about public space, urban design, green building, arts, culture and a healthy city and believes that investment in core services and effective service delivery make for a strong city. So I'm really excited to have you here today, Sarah. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to do the podcast. Yeah. Now, as far as topics are concerned, for our listeners to, to know what we're going to cover, we are going to basically focus on two main topics being uh, affordable housing. And we're going to talk about like what does affordable housing actually mean? Um, motions that have gone to council and been unsuccessful and successful, because I know this is an area that you're very passionate about. And I'm going to give you some feedback on what I'm hearing from developers and like to get your comments on, on what their, their, their uh, thoughts are. We're then going to switch to financial accountability in the city of Vancouver, one of my favorite topics, where we're going to talk about checks and balances, uh, the role of an independent auditor, and restoring confidence in city council. And we're going to talk about the mayor's discretionary spending too. Uh, and then finally, if we've got some time, we're going to talk about some of your passion items, such as some more supporting small businesses, this extended patio program, a car-free initiative on places like Granville Street and Commercial Drive. So why don't we start, so thank you for that. So why don't we start by just maybe you making a brief introduction and telling the listeners why it is that you ran for city council in 2018 in the first place and what was your passion for doing that? Uh, that is a, that's sort of the million dollar question. It's a great question. Um, I, I think I got the bug when I ran for park board in 2014. Um, and I was never one of those sort of young politicos that belonged to the whatever club, you know, back in university days and lived and breathed politics. So, you know, I was really interested in, you know, my city um, and sort of livability. But I used to work in tourism marketing, was the marketing director at Tourism Vancouver. And so I got involved in a lot um, to do with sort of, you know, promotion of the city and public space that way. Um, and the park board was a great way to dip your toe into it. I had a full time job. It's an expensive city to live in, you know, so I needed to do that and, you know, try to pay my bills. Um, but I really enjoyed it and I liked it. Um, and the parks board was everything that I think is the best about Vancouver, the green space and events and festivals and all those things. And the opportunity came up to run for council and I thought about it and it doesn't make a lot of sense from a schedule or, you know, sort of a privacy point of view or, you know, it's not, it's not the best in terms of uh, salary compared to the job I had in the private sector, but it's, it's kind of a privilege to do it. So it was that moment in time where you had a chance to do it. And I thought, why not give it a shot? Well, that's good. And, and did you, was it a pretty easy decision for you to make, Sarah, jumping from um, almost effectively doing a, a part-time job, although I know it's more than part-time hours in the, in the park board, to jumping into this full-time role as a city councillor? Was that a pretty easy decision to, to run for that? Yeah, it was. I mean, you're you're sort of leaping off into the unknown because anytime you run for office, there's a risk. You don't know if you're going to make it. And, you know, if you don't, you're signaling to your employer that you have that interest. So, you know, you have to be aware of kind of the impact of that decision. But for me, I think it was. I was sort of ready to go in that direction and move more towards, I think, public service. I'd, I've been working in tourism marketing in the hospitality industry for quite a while. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. Well, that's going to be, um, that background will be helpful in this conversation, especially with the um, the the Canadian, the BC, and the Vancouver economy having to kind of get back on its feet, and I believe that a lot of these policies that come from City Council are going to be really um, important in the next coming two years to help a lot of these businesses. And I know we're going to talk about that and how to get businesses back up and running. But let's go into our first topic. The big topic here uh, that we want to talk about to start is in housing and affordability. Now, housing is a big problem in Vancouver. And I kind of drill it down into three main categories. I talk about there's homelessness, there's affordable housing, and then there's the development, which is the people who build the homes to be able to house uh, families and individuals. Uh, I'm going to start by uh, posing a comment to you and follow up with a question. Okay, And this is with respect to uh, your fellow counselor, Christine Boyle. She introduced a motion to boost the production of non-market homes 
by allowing the nonprofit sector to build bigger buildings more quickly. Do you know what motion I'm talking about? I do. Okay. Yeah. Yep. This was a big one that, at council this month. So yes. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, this motion failed. Can you explain why? First of all, can you explain the motion to listeners to understand what we're talking about here? And then secondly, can you explain why you think it failed? Okay. So that's that's a big question. So let's break it down. Yeah. Um, we know that housing is the number one thing that Vancouver residents care about. Um, when you do any of the surveys around what are the core and the biggest issues in the city, housing affordability comes up number one every time. So obviously that's a priority. That's something that council wants to move forward on. With respect to the specific motion from Councillor Boyle, uh, which was to allow 12 stories in certain residential zones um, without having the need for a rezoning, so bypassing a public hearing, um, and if it was owned by a co-op, a government partner, or a nonprofit. So it made for a great campaign slogan. It had a lot of, you know, kind of dialogue and, you know, catchy phrasing around it, such as, you know, it shouldn't be easier to build a mansion than it should be to build uh, social housing. But the challenge is in the details, and, and housing is really complex. So council had recently had a public hearing prior to that, where after a lot of policy research by staff, they recommended that we approve up to six stories for social housing without a rezoning. And that was an effort to level the playing field, because in those zones, you can build outright four-story strata, um, but the rental didn't work on the economics at four-story, so staff did the research and said, let's allow six-story, that's the sweet spot, because six-story works for rental. Okay. Out of that, Councillor Boyle decided to bring this motion forward and, you know, say, why not double it, right? It's more housing, it's better. The challenge when seems you get... Seems logical. It seems logical, but the devil's in the details, because when you get into the economics of it, um, at six stories, you can still build wood frame construction, right? The numbers still work. You get into 12 stories, although there's advances in mass timber, you're moving to concrete construction. So that was a challenge. Huge public concern was raised about bypassing public hearings, right? Uh, because that took away the opportunity for democratic input. Um, that was something that people feel really passionately about their neighborhoods. Yeah. Um, the other thing too was what is affordability? And so under the city's definition of social housing, it a hundred percent rental project qualifies if only 30% of the units are below market. So what you were talking about was just 30% of units in a 12 story being eight percent right. below market. And to your point, the housing that we really need is for those on the lower end of the spectrum. So it wasn't necessarily going to deliver that level of affordability. And that was the real catch mm -hmm. um, around this project. It didn't provide the ability to plan for things like utilities and infrastructure. You wouldn't be collecting those utility development cost levies. Right. Um, so it was it was pretty fraught on a number of issues and concerns. The real challenge in what she raised, and I think you and I will get into because this is a big topic, is that our development um our rezoning process and our development um, permits are way too slow. That's adding a lot of cost and that's adding timing to the delivery of getting that social housing into the market. And so it just sort of said, let's not deal with that problem. Let's just leapfrog over it, um, omit the opportunity for public input um, and move forward. Plus, to be honest, there's already work underway by our staff. They were going to be coming back in July with a review of all of our rental programs to say, What's the best way to get the deepest level of affordability in these projects? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's a good answer. Thank you for that. Do you do you recall how close of a vote it was? Was it pretty? It wasn't close at all. Wasn't close at all. Okay. No, it, it was. That I often think, tells you. How... I think it was about eight to three, eight um, to three. and it went across party lines. Um, yeah, and so that's a pretty good indicator that it was a signal. Someone it needs wasn't to go back a, to the drawing board. Yeah, it wasn't a politically sort of ideologically divided vote. It was simply that council didn't feel that this was smart policy. Okay. We are going to talk about development, Sarah. Um, before we do, the other question I have is it seems to the outside observer, someone like myself, who's maybe a little bit of, you know, observant of what's going on in politics, but probably not to the level you're, you are, but it just seems like this council and mayor can't really get their self, selves organized. I mean, there seems like a real challenge to get a consensus. Um, so if we pick on the, this focus on the, the housing theme, why is it this city council and mayor can't get a consensus around what needs to be done from a housing initiative? It's a great question. I think you have for the first time in sort of, you know, recent history, um, a non-majority council, right? Where one party doesn't hold the majority of the seats. So that requires a lot of discussion and negotiation across different councillors. You also have a very diverse council, right? With a number of different parties and independents represented. Um, so that does require parties to come together and work together. Sometimes you see some political jockeying to put forth, you know, a motion or, you know, look to be seen to sort of be acting on an issue as opposed to, do you want to do the harder work and delve down into really getting the policy done or do you want to get the headline? 
Um, and, you know, that might ruffle a few feathers in terms of me saying that. Um, but it is it is part of it. So it, it does require a commitment to kind of work across the board. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's probably what I would say to that. I think there have been instances where council have really come together. Can you give uh, me an example? Yeah, I think uh, on things like supporting small business, um, you know, some of the pandemic recovery initiatives like the temporary patios, I'm sure we'll chat more about those later mm -hmm. on, um, sort of supporting tenants um, and trying to ensure that there's tenants rights in place for some of the older housing stock. So there's definitely been some instances, but there's been some real politics that have happened as well. Okay, so on that note, as it are, by, by contrast, are there any that you could say, man, we, we cannot as a council seem to ever get ourselves in a consensus type environment for this particular topic? Like, is there any one area where you, you don't, you think this is a, a failed effort? Yeah, I think it's it's the most top of mind because having just come off a 12 hour council meeting yesterday, oh, yeah. um, uh, this was actually the topic. And I think it's one of the biggest challenges that we have. And it is the fact that our permitting and licensing system is on life support in the city. Okay. Um, it just is. And so we had a report uh, that came back in response to a motion that, you know, Councillor Dominato and myself put forward around how do we clear the permitting backlog that is impacting every single facet of our city from, you know, the nonprofit, right, Food Stash Foundation that's trying to get food out um, during a pandemic to people that need it, to the small business that has rented a retail space and has to pay rent for an extra three to six months because they can't get the permit yeah. to housing, right, to getting the rental housing built, to getting the nonprofit housing built. Um, and we brought that forward. The mayor made a significant number of changes. You know, we wanted to put that sort of stake in the ground that said we are going to clear this backlog once and for all and put a date on it. Um, it got changed around quite a bit and went in the direction of let's have an internal task force. Um, but we came together on that one um, and said, you know, we may not have done it this way, but this is a common issue. It's the number one thing we hear about in terms of decline in service levels and dissatisfaction with city services. Um, and so we did that. So fast forward. We get the first report back from this task force. We have a brand new- Which was yesterday. Which was yesterday. Brand, or last couple of days, this took place over you know a couple of days. Brand new city manager, right? Gave them a mandate to fix this, said bring forth what you need to do. Bring us some tough recommendations if council has to make choices to kind of like, you know, get this house in order. And we heard from the city manager, he said, our permitting delays have never been worse. Our service has deteriorated. We heard from the head of development, business, and licensing, who said we are now at the point in the city that you know industry people are doing work without permits. Like you know, this this is significant, right? It's amazing. It was amazing. And what happened is we got um, these recommendations back to make some tough choices, and council wouldn't adopt them all. They said, well, no. And one of them was to delay um, the requirements for zero emission single family by 12 months. Not to take away that commitment to the environment. Council's really committed to that, but just saying, look, we're not gonna have capacity to actually do that. We'll Our backlog will get better. The city's gonna be at a standstill. Like we we need a reprieve here and you, council wouldn't do it. They said no. It's amazing. So I think that that's probably, I think that's one of the single biggest issues that we have. And I think it's crippling the city. Well, I completely agree with you. And uh, it's almost like you took my notes and studied them last night because that's exactly <laughs> what we were talking about here, Sarah. Well, I did um, I did have the benefit of spending, you know, 12 to 24 hours over yeah, two days in council en talking about it. So, yeah. Fair, fair enough. But yeah. you, you, this was the, the motion you're referring to is exactly one of the items. I'm going to give you some feedback that I've got sure. from some developers. Now, the first thing that's interesting, so I'm fortunate enough to be pretty plugged into the development community. And so I was able to talk to some pretty prominent developers in Vancouver. What was fascinating, first of all, is not one of them go, wanted to go on record. Like to me, that's a bit of a, a an eye opener in, a, in of itself. These are very successful, driven people. They employ a lot of people in the city and they don't want to go on record because they're worried about the blowback that they'll have by naming a counselor or saying something about the mayor or one of the staff or city staff, and all of a sudden their projects go right to the bottom of the pile or they never get the rubber stamp. And I think that's a, a really sad state to be in, and I think it's something that um, you and all the other counselors need to reflect on. But they were willing to give me feedback because they trust me and they know that I wouldn't release their names. Um, some of the feedback I got, there's a major building being built downtown Vancouver here, and I won't get too specific so we can't clear out, figure out who, which, which one it is, but there's a building downtown, and it's a major building. They're nine months into negotiations on their CAC. So for those listeners that are listening, CACs are community amenity, uh, contributions. amenity contributions. And this is basically a, a negotiation between a developer and the city on what they're going to kind of give back to the community in exchange for having the right to build a monster building. 
And I, we talked about this actually a lot on the podcast with Ken Sim. And they to, what these developers told me was that there are other communities they can build in, like the North Shore, Burnaby, where it's a schedule. You want to build this kind of building? This is what you have to give back. Very straightforward. In Vancouver, it's like this going to Tijuana and trying to barter for your, you know, whatever you're trying to buy, where you're going back and forth, back and forth, and having this sort of game of cards or chess. The second piece of feedback I got was a, uh, the type of building that you referred to earlier, which is the wood frame building. I think it was uh, around um, a four story, six story, six story building in the Canby main area. Mm -hmm. This builder took six years from date of acquiring the land to being able to rent it out, six years. And he basically said, I'm done building in Vancouver. I'm gonna just continue. He stopped building, this was one of his last projects. He stopped building in Vancouver about two years ago. He's like, too much risk. I'll go to the North Shore, I'll go to Burnaby, I'll go to Surrey, I'll go to Richmond, I'll go to West Vancouver, but I won't build in the city of Vancouver because I can't carry the risk of buying a piece of land and then waiting six years before I can either sell the property or I can rent it out. Um, and the feedback I got was that in these other communities like North Vancouver, these developers are able to get engagement with their city council members and the mayors very early on, same with Burnaby, and get a gauge on whether they're even on the right track for these projects. Here, the way it works is you basically have, a, have to have a bulletproof buttoned up project all done where you spend all your money up front, take it for uh, development permitting, I think is what it's referred to, and then fingers crossed it gets approved and that can take forever. One of the other uh, developers also told me they had submitted an application. They are now waited, I think it was, they've waited six weeks already to just get recognition that their application's been um, um, placed. And I can speak for myself. My wife and I are doing a, a backyard renovation and we are putting a little pool into our backyard for our kids. And so we need a pool permit. And we have, we finally got recognition, recognition that our application was in, inputted into this system. Uh, I think it was four to five weeks after we submitted it. And we are gonna wait in totality, probably about from the day we submitted it to the day we get approval, assuming there's no adjustments to it, probably looking at around three months to, to, to for a pool. By contrast, my in-laws are building a place in Saanich it's a, they've got four building permits. It's a pretty monster sized uh, build. They submitted their application and in five weeks they got approval for everything. So just to give you a contrast, I mean, Saanich is pretty small compared to Vancouver and it's on Vancouver Island. I've talked a lot, but you get kind of paints the picture of the problems that these developers are facing. And a lot of these developers have said to me, we're just not going to build in Vancouver anymore until things get cleaned up. So the only ones that are left, and those are, th those comments were largely from the smaller builders. The, the, one, the only ones that are left now are the ones with deep pockets with big dollars who are only going to go after big projects. So my first question, it's a very open-ended question to you, Sarah, is what would you tell a developer today as to why they should come back and start building in Vancouver again? Okay, so first of all, I'm not surprised because uh, I'm hearing all the same things that you're hearing. Um, right. That's why I expressed the frustration around permitting because it, people are starting to just bypass Vancouver and build outside the city. And it does delay um, people getting their infill housing built, right? You, we want people to maximize their land in single family areas, but oh, let's, you know, take so long to get that permit. Um, so we hear that loud and clear um, to the point around um, developers being afraid to say something we need to create that open level and dialogue because they're the ones that are building. They know what the backlogs are. Um, and it speaks to what I said earlier about the fact that our system's on life support. Like we are really, it, it, we're almost at a standstill now. The delays are unacceptable and they're, just, they're far longer than any other municipality. Um, so that's a good point. I think in terms of why build in Vancouver, there are a lot of folks that are passionate about it, that you know we have a beautiful city that have roots here. Um, that have put a lot of investment um, into the city and we need um, we need them and we need the housing supply um, to deliver that and move it forward. Um, I think that they do need to m make their voice heard because that political pressure is what helps us move the needle forward. When we had the um, speakers that came to council um, on the permitting motion that you know I referenced earlier that Councillor Dominato and I brought forward, we did hear from a lot of people. It wasn't all the large developers, as you say, 
but we sure heard from the residents, the people that were trying to build the addition on their house, right? Yeah, the do-it-yourselfers. Yeah, trying to build yeah. the coach house, right? Uh, trying to sort of, you know, um, do up a basement suite and make sure that it was it was legally permitted and, um, and you know, safe and met all of the code and all of those pieces. And um, heard all of the issues and the frustration that people had in the small business. So we're starting to hear it there, but we really need to hear it. Um, loud and clear. And the proof, honestly, is in the projects that will start to slow down mm -hmm. um, because they're just not there. So we're not going to meet housing targets. We're not going to meet demand. We're not going to get the level of affordability. So And there are people still moving in the city. Yeah, I would say continue to speak up. I take every meeting yeah. that somebody asks for, um, and I think it is great for them to bring it forward to council. We do have a new city manager in place now. We do have a new director of planning. Um, there is a very clear mandate um, in terms of clearing up development, business, and licensing, um, and in terms of working on prioritizing sort of the housing projects that are the most needed. So, you okay. know, we're starting off and we're trying to get there, but yeah, we've, we've, we've had some mixed success at council if we can't make the tough decisions. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you recognize that. And look, I put you in a bit of the hot seat, but I think that, um, out of okay. all the council, it, it goes with the territory. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know, you and Lisa Dominato are two of the city councillors who in my mind seem to be pretty pro let's get these projects built. Because is it fair to say you're uh, somewhat of a believer in the free market in the sense that supply and demand have a cause and effect? Well, I think I I think I bring a perspective on understanding economics. Yeah. The council and I am one of the you know looking around the table. There's some pretty diverse backgrounds from councillors, but I am one that has worked in private sector. Yeah. Um. So I did you know you know worked in the hotel industry right as a, on the senior management team there. Um. So you know land and hotel acquisitions is you know that gives me a perspective. Worked on the development side um, for a company also that did. Um, residential development. So I think I do bring that sort of pragmatic point of view as well as with a lot of small business. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's really important in terms of understanding just the economics um, and the costs um, of getting projects built. Um, I am a huge fan and supporter of supportive and social housing. Um, but absent of seeing the level of investment that you need from senior governments to make that happen, you need to look at all solutions in your toolkit. And that mm -hmm. includes working with the private sector. Yeah, sure. Do you believe that if there's enough supply created you ultimately create affordable housing because prices should theoretically drop if if things were permitted much faster and developers were able to make a little bit more of a profit or have less risk yeah i mean i think that's a, i mean that's that's a basic you know um, economic principle in terms of supply and demand so you do need to be bringing the supply in um, the trick is also always trying to guide that supply um, into the right stream. Yeah. Um, and that's where I think, you know, both private. Yeah, you don't want to, I mentioned Tijuana earlier. You don't want a Mexico type city environment. Where no, you don't, you don't, Mexico. you don't want to build all strata housing, for example, like, yeah. you know, 53% of the people in Vancouver now are renters. And then that's not going to go down um, because we have a finite amount of land. It's always going to be expensive, um, but it's not going to get cheaper if you don't provide people with options and yeah. that supply. Mm -hmm. Well, 53%, hey, that's 53%. Interesting number. So you and uh, Councillor Dominato put forward a motion aimed at clearing the growing permit backlog, and it was an unsuccessful motion. Um, so can you also, similar to the one with, Christ, uh, with Christine Boyle, can you explain what this motion was and why do you think it was defeated? So the motion, just to clarify, the motion did pass, um, but it, did it got pass, it sorry. did pass, but it got substantially amended by the mayor. Oh, I see. Um, and he put a focus Can on you, so so just because a lot of our listeners aren't really how, do, how does that in. how is that mechanic? Yeah, so like let's just quickly yeah, like layman's terms. You talk, okay. you you got listeners who are kind of business people. They don't really. You bring a motion, which means what? Yeah, so I'm a counselor and yeah. I decide I, you know, that permitting is really important and I want to bring that motion forward on behalf of residents of Vancouver to city council. Okay. So I call notice on a motion. I say, I intend to do this and it gets put on the next council agenda. Okay. At that point, it's put on the floor and it is the property of council for them to debate and decide upon that motion. Anything can happen. Council can say, yes, we like this. We're going to vote in favor. No, we don't. We're going to vote against it or we're going to amend it, which means we're going to change it up. And so we're going to send in different language. We're going to put in some different elements okay. to it, that helpful. kind of thing. So, there, so this was an initial motion by you and Councilor Dominato. Dominato. That's correct. And what was the, can you in, in simplify for us what yeah. the initial motion was? It, I think it acknowledged that we were uh, at a really critical impasse uh, for the delays that we're having in permitting and licensing. And as we said, everything from small business to housing um, and charities and nonprofits that impacts a great deal of it. And it had a very explicit call to action to hunker down and clear the permitting backlog um, and put a deadline on that sort of by the fall. Like we wanted to get that done and say, okay, we're just gonna, let's, what does it take? What resources do we need to put towards it? Let's get that backlog cleared. 
um, the mayor came in and amended the motion. So in that context, he came in, part of the debate and discussion, um, suggested forming an internal task force of staff without um, external industry advice, to your point. We have to work together. I think that you, you, know, you want to hear from those external partners around what are you experiencing? What are the bottlenecks? So um, struck an internal task force, put a million dollars at, th towards it, um, and you know, threw the, a number on the table and said, let's take out the timeline to clear the backlog, at which point we said, okay, we've lost the entire point here, which is that we need a crisis yeah. intervention yeah. and we need to get this done because- And did Mayor, we, Mayor Kennedy, when you say a million dollars, like he didn't just like flippantly throw that number out, did he? He threw, put that, well, he put that amendment on the floor. Just like a million bucks? Out, out of the blue. And said, We're going to talk about Mayor Kennedy <laughs> a little bit and his discretionary spending habits, but- uh, okay. Yeah, he did. And so, you know, the, the challenge with that was that the intention of the motion was to get the backlog cleared so that you could address then some of the systemic issues. Because one of the challenges is that Vancouver's regulations are so complex yeah. um, that it makes the approval processing difficult and unwieldy, and it just takes far, much longer than it needs to. We have our own building code from the rest of the province. Yes, that's right. We you have talked about this on Twitter the other night, actually. I did. It's really good. We have something called the Vancouver Building Bylaw Code, and yeah. you know, the pro everybody where else in the province has a different one, but no, Vancouver has its own. So, yeah. you know, if you're a builder, in your building, you can't go from Burnaby to Vancouver or Vancouver to Richmond and expect it to be the same. So you can mm -hmm. see how that gets complex really fast. And then all these regulations have been layered on over the years. We don't have the technology s system. It's not digitized. You can't, right? You're just starting now to be able to allow I think that's what you were highlighting in your tweet the other night was yeah. the digitization or the conversion to... Yes. Like there are... You should pull that tweet up actually. There are cities yeah. now where you can do everything entirely online. Submit your yeah. plans. Check on the status of your application, right? Get an automatic notification back. See all all of the yeah, correspondence sure. related to your project, see where you are in the queue, what yeah. date you're coming up. Yeah. Um, and you know, that's what I would expect. That's where we need to be. Um, so the date was taken out. Um, Councilor Dominado and I fought to get a date back in, which had to get pushed into next year, early next year to clear the backlog. So it passed, but it's what you call an amended motion. So it, it kind of got, you know, filtered down a little bit, yeah. if you will. Um, and that's kind of where we got to, and that's what resulted in the report that we had this week. Yeah. This million dollar report, or phase one, round one. This was the first one back. We'll yeah. be getting bi monthly reports from city staff that have yeah. sort of progressive recommendations about how we can simplify our regulations and how we can try to move things forward. Yeah. Okay. You mentioned about the fact that you used to work in private sector. I did. Do you find it tough to, like, when you mentioned that million dollar, like, for me as a taxpayer, and I, I run two businesses, we, 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 as my grandfather said years ago, if you take care of the pennies, the dollars will take care of themselves. And so I'm always amazed when I hear about something like the mayor just throwing out a million dollar, oh, let's just budget, like, let's just budget a million dollars for this, you know, some research report that we're gonna pay a bunch of staff to do internally. It, like, and you came from private sector. It, this, this it, was, it was pretty shocking. I think my head did the proverbial swizzle um, yeah. <laughs> because it didn't say I'm proposing a million dollars because I see it, you know, going towards the digitization or this yeah. project has been costed out or here is the ROI on this investment. It was just sort of an unencumbered yeah. million dollars. And I actually didn't support that um, off the bat because I said, well, we have staff haven't come back to us yet and told us what they actually need. Sure. Um, and, you know, I used to run large marketing departments and I had to produce a budget and then I get up there and did. defend my budget 100%. and then I had to show what results I had generated from my budget um, and by, we had a monthly kind of check-in and accountability on that and if it wasn't delivering the return then you had a hard time in the yeah. next budget cycle and that's so I come from that environment so yeah it's it's a pretty different place to be well we're going to talk about that in a little bit because of uh, financial uh, sir um, uh, financial accountability is something that's very important to me but staying on the topic of of development. Um, another question I have for you is, is when we're talking about this backlog, is like, like how bad, it, I mean, I've given you some anecdotal comments of the people I've spoken with, but like when you got this report in the last couple of days saying that it's the worst it's ever been, like how, like, can you paint a picture for us of how bad it is? Yeah, I think local BC, um, who works with, supports local small business, right? Sort of a research advocacy yeah. group, did a study that cited if the average permit time to get a new small business up and running is about 8.2 months, that the cost stores or the economic loss and cost for that um, was about, you know, sort of shy of $800,000. So imagine yeah. that. Um, and it's almost rents are so expensive. So if you yeah. are the small business person trying to make a go of it, right, stepping up, right, and you're going to like give it a shot 
and you rent your space and you think your permit's going to take three months, but it takes six or nine. And meanwhile, you're holding an obligation and you have to pay rent on that yeah. space. You don't have any revenue coming in. Not only are you maybe going to go underwater before you open, yeah. Um, but look at the lost economic productivity in the city. So it's it's significant. I filled a lot of emails and questions. You start to feel a bit like a traffic or cop or dare yeah. traffic controller yeah. from people that are just so frustrated because they haven't heard back on their permit. And it's everything from this pharmacy in Point Grey that wanted to move literally next door in the same block um, that had an issue with because there was some archaic rule that said he couldn't move. Um, and then... Uh, you know, I referenced the small business, um, or sorry, the nonprofit operator who was trying to get food out, right? A charity to people during the pandemic, had their space ready to go. It was a restaurant use, had issues in getting in there. So it's it's every facet of society. Well, I just, I mean, as another example, we just had Roger Hardy, who's the founder and CEO of Kits Eyewear. He acquired, I don't know if he acquired the land, but at least he's acquired the, the lease for that coffee shop down the corner of Cornwall and you. Yep. And right in the heart of Kitsilano. Yeah, it used to be old Starbucks. Yep. And and it's right across street from local. And how long has he had the application in now to get was it nine months? It's cost him roughly about the number you gave, about seven hundred thousand or so, I think is what he said. And he actually said, he goes, you know, most coffee oh he goes, all we want to do is like filter hot water and give people some a coffee and maybe check out some new eyewear they can buy at their flagship store, because it was going to their coffee yeah. shop slash flagship store. I mean, here's a person who's created an incredible amount of employment in the city. He's paid a ton of taxes. He's very plugged in, very dialed in, a very smart individual. So I think the resources, and he even said, admitted himself, he goes, if I didn't have the resources I had, I'd have to cancel this a long time ago. There's no way some you know small little mom and pa type operator that wants to run a little coffee shop could ever pull that that's off. That's the challenge because you're, you, you know, we're squashing that entrepreneurship for those small businesses in the city. Because if you don't have the ability to hang on, we're just not going to see those businesses. And that's a great example of one of the things we identified is that could be fast tracked. Because if you're not having a change of use, like you have had a restaurant space, yeah, it was now going to be now it was a Starbucks, a coffee shop to a coffee shop, a restaurant yeah. space to a restaurant space. You're not you're not changing use materially. It's not like you went from a retail space to food primary yeah. and you had to have a coastal health inspection. I mean, there that was what we identified is let's figure out what those streams are, and try to you know fast track some of those. Through and, and realize that we don't need to check every step of the way. We could go to more of a compliance yeah. model where you could do spot checks to make sure that there's no health issues. But So Sarah, it seems very obvious to me that you've drank the Kool-Aid on this and you get it. And I'm assuming I haven't interviewed her yet, but uh, Councillor Dominato obviously does too, but yet we still have the same problem. Is the problem because we have a lack of leadership at the top or there's not enough um, Sarahs and Lisas out there who understand this? Is the problem over on the city staff side? Like, like, how do we get this fixed quickly? I, I think it's the pain point, and I think we're there. You know, you have to have a pain point that's sufficient enough that it creates right. that tipping point. I think the problem has been competing priorities at council um, and just complex regulations that have built up over years without the systems in place to move things forward. Um, we do have a new city manager now who I'm really delighted about. So we've yeah. got Paul Mokri in place, who was formerly a deputy city manager. He's got some great experience. I know this is a priority for him. So I think that's, you know, sort of a beacon. And he's not a recruit from the States either, right? No, he's a Vancouver person. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So got roots in the community. Uh, not a novel idea that we have talent right here in our own backyard that we yeah. can hire. I, 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 well, it's great to see people kind of that you can promote from within, right? And yeah. Paul has some great respect in the city. So I think he's going to be a beacon of hope for that. Um, but you do need council to kind of pull together and send that solid signal of support. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, let's, let me finish off with a question more along the lines of the, um, the issue of homelessness. Um, does it make sense for the city of Vancouver, BC housing and the province to keep buying these old hotels for way, what appears to be way above market prices? I mean, you, you see the news, right? I mean, you got an assessed value. Now that always, it doesn't always give you what the market value is. And you see what the city's paying for these hotels. Um, so does it make sense for all three levels of government to keep buying up these hotels instead of finding a consensus on the issues of development? Like, So there's a lot in there. And I think there's, I'm going to talk about one thing that I don't think has been covered enough okay. in this dialogue. So we've at any given time, we've got approximately 2000 homeless people, right? Yeah. And sheltered, unidentified, um, living on the streets of Vancouver. 
Um, and that's a significant issue, right? So from a just from an equity and a compassion perspective, you want to get people housed. Um, it makes sense economically. It makes sense socially. You have all of the sort of associated um, drains and demands on on um, downstream on police and fire and social services. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, and you know, so that's that's just the that's just a human thing to do, um, and it's just a smart policy thing to do to give people sort of the dignity of having a roof over their head. Um, the city has jumped in on this area in the absence of investment from senior government because a lot of those sort of the housing has not been built and that's the challenge you're trying to catch up with and so i think that there's more of an advocacy role for the city to play as opposed to trying to take on and solve this challenge because it's max it's massive you can't do it on your own mm -hmm. having said that lately with the specific programs that have resulted in the hotel programs a lot of that has happened i think because of the way the federal um rhi rapid housing initiative was constructed that there was a period of time by which you had to identify how you could spend it in order to provide housing um, and yet there's time for the application, there's a time in order to get it in and get that money realized. So purchasing hotels fit the parameters of the grant program um, and was a way to sort of check that box and get it in there. I think the challenge in that, you're not always providing the maximum number of units relative to if you had a site and you were building. Right. Um, you number one, and sometimes you have to retrofit those sites and other things. But the other issue that we're going to have coming back just from an economic point of view, switching from sort of the social policy, but to the economic side is tourism. Because prior to the pandemic, we actually had a shortage of hotel rooms in the city of Vancouver, where we were turning away tourism business because we don't have enough rooms. So now you're taking all these hotels out of inventory, which means that as your tourism industry rebounds, you're not going to be able to have enough rooms to host those sporting events and the conferences and peak tourism season. And what does that mean? It means that Vancouver becomes a destination for wealthier visitors because your rates are going to go up, supply and demand. Sure. Just like, you know, housing. Just like right? housing. Exactly. Just like housing. It's Very a simple analogy. equation. It's like. <laughs> yeah. So we have a, we sort of have a tourism crisis that's looming there. Um, and, and it, it's it's been the expedient option to try to get people um, sort of off the street, but it's not a long term solution compared to sort of building purpose built where you can get a higher number of units where you can also get the right services on site for supportive housing. Right. Really, Which to try really to give important. people like it's it's hugely important, right? So that yeah. um, people can get that leg up and hopefully get to you know a better place, right? Because that was one of one of Sam Sullivan's criticism. He came in on the podcast during the provincial election series that we did, and he talked about the Howard Johnson Hotel down here which basically was, as I understand, was bought, I think, by BC Housing. Um, do, you know what, do you know which one I'm talking about? I do. Yeah. The challenge that they were moved so quickly was without a plan and those supportive services in place. And so I can't tell you how many emails and phone calls I've gotten from people in downtown South who are seeing those impacts on their community. And people sure. are welcoming in terms of social housing if it's done with a plan yeah. um, where those supports are in place. Because it's good for community, but it's also good for the people that need the services. Yeah, um, And that that's a great example of one of the challenges there, either that the plan isn't in place to deliver the services or all the ways the buildings themselves are not designed to actually accommodate them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, those are those are some great comments, Sarah. Thank you for that. Let's, um, let's jump now. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about with respect to affordable housing in Vancouver we can always come back if you like but is there we, I think if we if we keep going on that one we'll probably take up the rest of the time because it's, it's, a, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a massive topic but yeah okay let's uh we're going to jump to financial accountability um and there's a few things to, to 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 go over one of them is uh and I talked about this with Colleen Hardwick about an auditor general because I understand she was the one who brought this motion forward in the first place so I guess first question for you is um Number one, do we have an auditor general in place in the city of Vancouver today? Uh, we will soon. Do we have uh, one right now? Not yet. Um, we're in the process of hiring an auditor general. Okay. So we talked. This is something we talked about um, collectively during the campaign. Yeah. And then Councillor Hardwick brought it forward. Um, it was well supported at council. Passed that motion. We struck a recruiting committee. I sit on that um, along with some other councillors, um, and we're going through that process of uh, trying to select our first auditor general and have them in place. So ideally, anticipating that they would uh, they would be hired um, and in place for the end of this year and hit the ground running for 2022. Okay, when when the uh, idea of an independent auditor general was first brought up by Councillor Hardwick, um, there was public pushback from former city manager Sedu Johnson. Um, why do you think this was this was the case? Like, why do you think he had pushback? Do you think that maybe he was afraid there wouldn't be enough um, for his salary in his office because he made a claim that it was going to cost over $2 million a year to have an auditor general 
Do we know what an auditor general is going to cost the city of Vancouver? So, so here's what I would say to that. I think that change um, of any type can be discomforting to people. Um, I believe we budgeted about a million, million and a half um, for the first full year of an auditor general. What we know from researching across Canada and cities that have them, uh, Toronto and Ottawa and others, is that all of those cities that have implemented one have shown a positive ROI on that function that has been realized through savings um, from audits that the independent auditor generals have completed. So financially, yes, you put in some money up front, um, but generally speaking, the cities get it back. That's been demonstrated. There's a track record. But you also start to rebuild a really priceless commodity, which is public trust. Right. Um, and I think that people are looking for that level of accountability. Um, if w there are concerns around that from sort of existing staff, I don't think we should ever be afraid because we are public servants, right? So whether we are professional civil servants or you're an elected public servant like I am, um, that's our job and that's who we answer to. So we shouldn't be afraid of a level of scrutiny and good. that's to me is sure. just good, good governance. I agree, 100%. Right. I mean, to speak to that, what I find amazing is having spent most of my career in the financial services industry and as a financial advisor, stockbroker, whatever you want to call it, um, I'm myself and my team are constantly analyzing financial statements of public companies every quarter. If you're a public company in Canada, you're obligated to publish your financial statements every single quarter, and there's a t deadline on when you do it. So if you're a big company, you have to have it published, I think, within six weeks of the end of each quarter. And if you're a small company, I think you've got up to two months. By contrast, the city of Vancouver, as far as I know, is only obligated to publish its financial statements once a year. And even when you look at those, they're pretty vague. There's some very big line items in there that don't have any sort of insight. Would you, um, what would your thoughts be on the contrast between, you know, public companies or even if you're a private business owner, I know if I was a private business owner, I am a private business owner. I expect my accounting team to have financials for me on a quarterly basis. I don't wait for once a year. And on top of that, I should point out that when the city of Vancouver's year end comes up, which is December 31st, the public doesn't even get to see the financials and how the money was spent or allocated till like May, which by that point, you're already ha almost halfway through the next year. So I, I, I think that the city financials, they are dense. They are obscure. Um, again, coming from the private sector, you know, we did the monthly P&Ls. You had your statements. You, If you were a department head like I was, you had to reconcile your budget. If you had you know, fluctuations or variations, then, you know, you needed to account for those. It was your job to stay within the budget that was allocated. Um, and again, to demonstrate what the return was that came from that. Um, I think it's public money, right? It's people that go to work. Um, they're working pretty hard. They're paying their taxes to that. Um, I think if anything, we deserve a higher level of scrutiny, um, almost in the private sector, because that's your dollar. Um, so I, I, I have no issue at all with standing up for that so would yeah, you every support day of the week. quarterly or semi-annual statements published? hundred percent. Absolutely. I mean, we've, there's a number of us at council that have been trying to push for more detail or a line item budget so that you can actually see what some of those expenses are. Cause you get these big buckets and you're like, well, what's going into that? And, and it exactly. just, it becomes, you feel a bit like you're a forensic detective because you're you kind of are, you, you're, you're kind of are, I am. Yeah. I mean, and I, I do it through FOIs that I have to run. Yeah. I mean, I have an MBA. It's not, it's not an accounting. My, you know, my dad was a CA mine's in PR and communications, a little bit yeah. of a different field. <laughs> um, but you're delving in to try to get a sense of, you know, what's our, What's our HR complement in these departments? How do these expenses compare year over year, right? What are the pressure points? Um, um, where are the efficiencies? Like mm -hmm. all of those questions. So it's not mm -hmm. it's not presented in a way that kind of is digestible um, and it should be. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I would absolutely support more transparent, um, okay. frequent Great. reporting. Well, thank you. Um, Cause I, I agree. And let me, this is a good segue into uh, some analysis that I did and we've got it here on our screen. Um, so I decided to pull the uh, the 2020 and 2019, but we'll look at 2020. Um, these are the what I describe as the ma the costs for maintaining mail, mayor and council. Now these are direct costs. These are your re remuneration or your pay. So for example, in 2020, the lowest paid was Jean Swanson. I don't know why. But she was paid just over eighty-six thousand dollars. Most of you were paid between ninety-two to ninety-five thousand dollars, and then Mayor Kennedy Stewart was paid one hundred and seventy-one thousand dollars.
But what's shocking to me is not, I mean, the pay is the pay, okay? And it's candidly for that kind of pay for all the work you do, I think you've probably earned every penny and um, you probably get paid way below minimum wage if you divide by the number of hours you spend. That's not math I want to do. Yeah. <laughs> So I, my, my beef is not with the remuneration. In fact, I should also highlight that Sarah Kirby Young was the second least costly um, uh, city councillor in our city. So you, you, you're very economical. I, I, I have been, yes. Yes. It's public, I, it's public money. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, as an example, discretionary expenses, your discretionary expenses are the uh, second lowest in overall cost, like I said, is, is the uh, second lowest as well. Um, Mayor Kennedy Stewart's discretionary expenses for last year were $829,000. That represents 39% of the entire cost, direct costs of mayor and council, almost, almost 40, squeaking on to 40%. And it's discretionary. So my question to you, and by con just to give a, a contrast here, Sarah, your discretionary expenses last year were $2,900. His was $829,000. Can you give me some perspective, because I can't find it in the financials, sure. as to what this money's being spent on? Yeah, so I can give you some perspective. You've got 10 councillors and one mayor. Um, in terms of we each get one vote, right? So when you're you know, having those debates that we talked about and there's a motion at, at council on the floor or a report in front of us, um, every vote counts the same, right? Um, however, the mayor does have some additional statutory responsibility. So a lot of his discretionary budget goes towards his individual political staff. So he has the ability, which council do not have, to have political staff. So he has two chiefs of staff, some communication people, right? Stakeholder relations, uses it for market research, right? Uh, you know, number of, of sort of different activities. Councillors have access to a shared assistant who are city employees, the mayor's employees. Who's been are, very helpful, by the way, in getting you on oh, the show. Oh, good to know. Yeah. I'm glad. <laughs> um, and, but the mayor's employees are report to the mayor, and they are political employees. The council assistants are city of Vancouver employees. So we get access to a half, sometimes a third of an assistant, depending. Um, and it's not a lot of capacity, so they can help with things like, you know, some calls coming in, helping to schedule some meetings, that kind of thing. But we are precluded from using them for political purposes. So I can't send out a political communication you know, I can't, you know, utilize them to help with a, an event that's a partisan event or anything of that nature. So it's really just sort of limited administrative support, whereas okay. the mayor in his role has a lot more discretion to hire and utilize those political staff and use them for political communications. Okay, that's great. Well, thanks for helping explain the reason for them. So my next question on this is, do you think $829,000 is a reasonable amount of discretionary expenses? Like if you were the mayor of Vancouver, would you be at $829,000 as well, probably? Well, I know that that has grown significantly over the years. I believe it used to be about Way half. Way higher than inflation. Yeah, it used to be about half, I think. And then there was, I think, during uh, Mayor Gregor Robertson's term, there was a significant adjustment that was made. So There was. Yeah, I, I mean, it's. It, I think... I think the system is out of whack. Um, I don't think it's setting councillors up to be able to, you know, sort of truly fulfill and support their role and get out in the community in the same way. They don't have the same ability to be active on communications and, you know, get out, get out sort of those political messages that the mayor does. And that's really important to engage constituents. I don't think necessarily you need two chiefs of staff. Um, that's something that's relatively new. Um, you know, he's got one that focuses on internal stakeholder relations, one apparently that focuses on external. So, yeah, I, I would probably structure and do things differently. Um, I'd want to make sure as a, that a council is supported to do their job too. Okay, so I guess my next question then would be, are you proposing that there should be more money available to city councillors um, to raise their discretionary spending? Or are you suggesting that we should reduce the mayor's ability to have discretionary spending? What are you proposing? Well, so, you know, here's a little bit of background that there was a proposal and it was actually brought forth by the mayor to raise councillors discretionary spending um, up from 6000 up to 30000 per councillor per year. Um, that did pass. I, along with a number of councillors, didn't support it. And the reason that we didn't, it was a, an amendment thrown on the floor, um, kind of came on the fly. And it was part of the bigger budget discussions when we were looking at the significant tax increases that were being proposed. So let me give you some context between yeah. 2010 and 2018. The average, you know, if you average it out on a yearly basis, tax increase average out to about 3%. In the first year this council took office in 2019, it was 6.09%. In 2020, 
the tax increase for residents was 7.69%. That's just property tax. So that doesn't include utilities, mm -hmm. you know, all metro fees, all those other things. And this year, just due to the public pressure in the pandemic, um, you're looking at potentially around five based on a motion put forward by the mayor to cap it in response to public pressure. Yeah. Still way to above cap it. Still way above, still way above inflation. Yeah. So you've sort of had these ongoing sustainable or unsustainable and significant tax increases that have been the biggest in a decade in the city of Vancouver. So in the context of that broader budget discussion, there was this amendment thrown down that we would increase the councillor discretionary budgets. And we sort of said, look, it doesn't look good if we're charging this much to people in the city that are struggling, um, that council discretion is is put up by the, that by that much and so we voted against it it also i don't think dealt with the bigger problem of what's the right structure to actually properly support counselors so it was mm -hmm. sort of left up to council if you want to hire an assistant you can if you want to do something with it and i think structurally you actually just need to put a system in place that makes sure that every elected representative has the ability to deliver for their constituents and do the job sure so in 2019 mayor kennedy stewart spent seven hundred and sixty seven thousand dollars on discretionary expenses and then last year he spent 829 which is an increase of um, roughly about another sixty thousand dollars maybe for a new communications officer i don't know um so my question would be first of all is there a cap on how much the mayor's discretionary expenses can be and if there isn't would you support putting a cap on what that number is there isn't a cap currently it just comes forth and gets approved as an as a, an actual amount as part of the annual budget process but there's no capping mechanism if you will other than just it's just wrapped up into the budget it's just wrapped up in the budget so did you is, vote in favor of the budget i did not vote in favor of the operating budget no yeah. because i thought the tax increase was way above inflation and i think people are having a tough time and it's not sustainable was that your only reason for not voting in favor of it or was that the primary one that was the primary one um i think also because i don't think that council are prioritizing we're seeing a lot of degradation of basic services in the city um, we're not willing to just zero in and focus on priorities whether it's things like you know we're going to focus in on you know smart housing policy and housing affordability and just pick two or three things that we can try to do really well. Um, this council has had a bit of a tendency to go shopping um, and sort of put everything in the grocery cart and not want to take anything out. Right. Um, and so it, it's, it's like they don't want to face the fact that we've been in a global pandemic um, in an already very stressed environment before that pandemic came. And it's now time to like make some tough decisions. Yeah, it's, 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 there's different philosophies on that. You obviously have costs that you have to keep pace with because you have wage inflation and you know you need to make sure people are taken care of and you have core services you need to deliver and you need to sort of deal with some of those core social issues but yeah it this has not been a council that's been willing to sort of say you know what we're going to put some things on the back burner and we're going to just focus on these for now mm -hmm. um good answer well let's talk about wage inflation I, I swear you got my notes the night before so uh just to start sarah um, are you getting paid more or less now than you did two years ago? Me? Yeah. Coming from private sector? No, no, no. Uh, okay. like, no, no, sorry. No, no. <laughs> That's a whole yeah. other no, conversation. No. <laughs> as, a, as a city councillor, has your pay gone up or gone down? Or has it stayed flat? Uh, well, there's a couple answers to that. There's a, there's a council compensation policy. Um, and so in that bylaw, it states that we will be adjusted by sort of the lower level of inflation. So I think council gets adjusted. It's usually less than the adjustment for collective and unionized employees. So I think it's it's one percent or one point five percent. Yeah. Depending on the year. So it's 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 nominal. Um, I, I thought the city council took a pay cut last year. Well that's yeah, exactly. That's you you, you read my notes. Okay. Um yeah that's exactly what I was gonna say is that council did stand up and say that we were gonna take a ten percent pay cut and we did in response to the pandemic. Yeah. Um and so that's why you will see salaries that were lower um for part of last year. Um, yeah, that's in order what I to sort of govern through that period of time. Yeah. So that is the lead into um an article that was written at in the Georgia Strait back in March of twenty twenty one, which looked at whether uh the ten percent pay cuts promised by Mayor Kennedy Stewart uh, as a result of this pandemic actually happened amongst the what is described as directing management and council. Now, you just pointed out council did take a 10% pay cut. But the city manager, general manager, director of finance, general manager of arts, culture and community services, director of legal services managers, all received a 5% deduction. And I think it's fair to say that every one of these people get paid more than you do. Well, and some of them they, get paid they do. pretty I mean, decent six-figure salaries. Yeah, I mean, if, if you're if you're in so, it for the money, don't become a counselor, right? You're, yeah. you're far better off, you know, um, becoming working staff. for the city. 
Absolutely. Yeah, you get a nice six-figure salary and you get a phenomenal pension. So these people got a 5% pay cut in a time when other Vancouverites, restaurant owners, people in the hotel industry, your background, and have been struggling to even stay afloat. So how does the city expect to keep the confidence of voters when examples like this happen? So staff did, the exempt staff did take a 10% pay cut. Most of that was done through furloughs. So they worked 10% less time. Um, and that's how that was achieved, right? So if you were a five day week person, you were doing a four day, right? Or you were taking it, you know, working. And just one, explain what, what's an exempt staff? That's a non-union. Non-unionized staff. That's the kind of management yeah. people. So management okay. or administrative staff, anybody that's not part of the union and the collective agreements. Mm -hmm. um, and so they did take that for that, um, 10% reduction, and that was done through furlough time. So they worked 10% less time, basically. Um, but so we got less 10% less productivity with no savings. Right? It was it was a cost containment measure, okay. um, honestly, because the city revenues were down significantly yeah. um, during the pandemic. So think of all of the things like civic theaters that were closed, parking revenues that sure. were down, community centers that weren't open, people weren't taking programs. And so that was, a, I think, a, res a, a responsible measure and a des an effort to sort of keep the budget in check mm -hmm. when we were facing... But isn't it fair to say that if I can be the devil's advocate here, like you've got leadership starts at the top. These are the leadership people. They're not really taking a pay cut. I mean, in absolute, and on, a, on their T4, on their financial state, like when they go to file their tax returns, yes, they've got a lower income, but they've got more free time because they're not working as much. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I think it depends who you asked. I think there's still, there's a lot of staff that have, the pressures have been pretty significant um, mm -hmm. in some areas during the pandemic and they've worked the extra hours anyway. And I think okay, so, in a lot of the time, so, so in I, think reality, we, I think we did see that in a lot of cases. Okay, um, so and I, I do want to kind of honor and appreciate a lot of the staff, particularly those that were um, sort of in social services or dealing with um, closure of a lot of our, our facilities in the downtown east side and trying to support populations where if anything, the pressure is really ramped up for them. Um, so it did create a lot of pressure there. Um, okay. But yes, it is true that they it wasn't a 10% pay cut and they were there 100% of the time they were there 90% yeah. of the time. Okay, or at least in theory. Correct. But there's, as you're pointing out, there's some people who probably never stopped working any less hours than they did before. But absolutely, yeah. Okay, I want to I want to carry on with the Auditor General. Um, I highlighted the fact that the former city manager Sidhu Johnson did not seem in favor through his sort of public comments, which is rare to see by a city manager. Have you got any sense with this new city manager Paul Mokri? Mokri, thank you, Paul Mokri. If he supports the idea of a uh, Auditor General? You know, I, I could not be more pleased to have Paul in this role, and I'll tell you why. Yeah. Um, I think it's because he is the consummate public servant, so he understands the professional nature of that job um, and doesn't politicize it. Because we're the politicians, so there's enough in our arena mm -hmm. of that going on, and his job is to be a professional administrator um, and run the city, and he does that, and to support the will of council. Um, and so I have every confidence that Paul will do that. Um, he's demonstrated that. And I think that was a key, honestly, a key factor in hiring him. Um, yeah. And one of the reasons I was, you know, really happy to see him step up into that role. Um, so, yes. And in that case, um, I think that that is an example of when council did its job and exercised the will of council and said, no, this is important for the city. We want to have an independent auditor general. We want to have this arm's length function um, that should have the discretion and independence to delve into something if they think that, we could be getting better value for something or if there's a complaint that comes in from the public or whatever the case is there. Like, are we getting the desired level of affordability on our housing projects? Are we seeing the return on investment of those community amenity contributions? Whatever the issue is, um, I think it's really important to have that check and balance and that oversight. Yeah, um, It just makes us better. So, yeah, I think that that is one time when council did shine um, and step up and said, this is the will of council. Yeah. OK, good. OK, well, that's good. That's a good sign. It is a good sign, these, isn't it? Uh, jury topic. You sit on the Auditor General Recruiting Committee, and you mentioned that you highlighted this earlier that it sounds like we're getting close. Is the city on track to be up and running with this individual by 2022? Absolutely. Before that, possibly? Um, well, it, it'll take a little bit. We're still in the hiring process now. Yeah. You want to make sure it, it's a really important role, so you want to make sure you've got a well-credentialed and, and, and really solid individual there. Yeah. Um, and there will be a bit of ramp-up time because remember, Vancouver's never had this function, right? So you need office space. They've got to hire up people. They've got to decide yeah. what auditing um, framework they're going to utilize. They've got to develop an audit plan and decide what those first audits are going to be. So it's going to ramp up over a period of time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I am really looking forward to having that Good. up and running. So am I. 
um, makes my job less uh, less work for me as a someone who I, do, I run feeder information requests with the city all the time and the province because I'm a big fan of financial accountability. I'm glad you've been on record to say that you support regular financial statements as opposed to once a year. Let's jump to something I know you're super passionate about. I see on Twitter all the time talking about this. This is the, this is the patio program. So maybe just to paint a picture for the listeners, what is the patio program? Why are you so ex- 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 excited about it? And, and has it been extended? Those are the three questions. Okay, so this is the fun stuff, um, yeah. and and I get I get really jazzed about this. Um, so, in response to the pandemic, um, and we have an amazing restaurant culture in the city. Um, majority of our businesses are small business. These are independent entrepreneurs, right? Restaurant business is tough at the best of times. And when we saw the provincial health orders come through that limited capacity for indoor dining, um, and talking with a lot of the restaurants and the different business improvement associations, became clear that expanding patios was one way that we could give people a chance to safely dine outside and give those restaurants a lifeline. And so that um, resulted in a motion that I brought forward to council, which birthed something called the TEP or the Temporary Expedited Patio Program. And so what this meant was that the city was gonna be a lot far more flexible in the use of public space. So that, you know, we're gonna do curbside patios and curb lanes. You could set up in front of your business. Um, You could do it more quickly and extraordinarily, those patio permits, once we got that program up and running, were turned around in 48 hours. Right, that is unheard of compared to the months that it took people to we get just that spent going. Like Forty minutes talking about. <laughs> we did, and yeah. so this is a, here's another success story. This yeah, is a great, great example. I call yeah. it the silver lining to the COVID cloud. Yeah, is that we were actually able to pivot, and by relaxing regulations and saying, okay, you know what, you can just go do this. Like here's some guidelines, right? Please try to stick to them. Accessibility is important. We're going to do some checks, but you know we're going to recognize that you know this is a sort of COVID survival mechanism and an economic response. Um, and it was phenomenally, like staggeringly popular. I think we've had over 600 of those temporary patios that have been. Oh, I see them all over the place. They're everywhere. You go yeah. down Main Street, and you, you yeah. know you sort of you know into like every neighborhood in the city, right down um, Demon, um, Davy, all over. And it's yeah. it's amazing to see, but it's created this patio culture. And this vibe in the city where people are like, wow, Vancouver feels vibrant. And why didn't yeah. we have this before? And yeah. we shouldn't have taken a pandemic to have it. But I actually think well, that's that- exactly my question, Sarah. Like, I mean, I'm glad you're celebrating it. I really am. I truly am. Yeah. And I'm glad it's happening for these uh, restaurant owners and for the people who are dining there. But I guess my question is similar to this permitting process, which is now all gone online because people can't go to City Hall. Like, why did it take a damn pandemic for our leaders at the top? people like you and mayor and the city manager to kind of come to the realization that we should have done this five, six years ago. I think it, it's it's a culture shift, right? And sometimes yeah. you need these, you know, moments in time and these major events to sort of tip, right, the culture and move it forward. And mm-hmm. I'm a huge fan of taking the opportunity of those moments to create a legacy okay, um, or taking the opportunity to pilot things so that people can see them. And instead of trying to plan for every eventuality, the city tries to do risk management and is it going to work in every single situation? And, you know, sidewalks are going to be like wider in one area and not another and all those things. I'm like, let's just do it and then figure out where we need to yeah. adjust. And, and and I think that that's actually a really good. Um, and that's an entrepreneurial kind of, mind that's speaking there. I like that. Pro- probably. Yeah. Um, I think that's a really good kind of um, parallel for what we can do with permitting. If we get out of the way and simplify the regulations and potentially focus on more spot checks or compliance, look at what you could do in terms of how you could really yeah. activate that public realm. So Yeah, maybe maybe there's a way in which you could ha- pilot a permitting process just for a certain type of permit or a certain exactly. size or... Small events and festivals, right. pat- pop-up patios, yeah. Yeah. all those things. And then let that grow from there. And they make people smile. It makes yeah. people happy. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So, so will I, in 2022, when hopefully none of us have to even worry about anything to do with coronavirus anymore... Will I still see, hopefully, just as many patios out there in, in the next summer as we're starting to see this summer? So, yeah, absolutely. Um, you're going to see seasonal. Pa- I think a seasonal patio program is here to stay. Okay. Hearing loud and clear from restaurants they want it, hearing from residents that they want it. Um, I think our staff have seen how popular it has been. I'm going to be championing and fighting for it yeah. and making sure that when staff bring back and say, okay, here's how the patio program can work now with our what was our permanent patios before and what we used to charge for them and what this looks like of how we use public space that it's it's fresh it's flexible it's not yeah. overly regulated it's not overly expensive so yeah that's that's what we're going to be having to really yeah. laser in on is to make sure that 
we don't revert back and we try to keep this nimbleness that we've created. Yeah. Oh, good. Well, I'm glad to hear that because that one, and you know this because you used to work in this industry, but that's one sector that's really been taken on the teeth for the last 12, 14 months. Oh, it's huge. So, I mean, when I was at Tourism Vancouver, because I was the director of marketing at Tourism Vancouver for right. a number of years um, and launched the Dine Out Vancouver Festival. Um, and it, that's those are the kind of programs that you can see the legacy of year after year. And I think patios is going to be like that, right? Where so you were part of that. Yeah, I, I, that was my team. We started that. Really? Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. Did the logo. When was the first it. Dine Out Vancouver? It's got to be like 10 years ago or something. Oh, gosh. It might almost be 15 now. Wow. Yeah. Oh, so you started working there in your 12. Exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So the pr patio program, good job. Which, do you have any like top patio places you like going to? We'll plug for some of the um, local business owners here. Oh yeah, there's so many. Um, I for comfort food, I love Burgoo on Burgoo. Main and Mount yeah. Pleasant. That's a great one. Yeah. Um, Salade des Fouy is great in South Granville. Just yeah. Off sort of Granville and Seventh there. That's a great little spot. Um, yeah. yeah, there's so many all yeah. over the city. I, um, I feel um, like I feel like I'm going to upset a neighborhood if I don't mention. Yeah, some no, of the different yeah ones. that's OK. That's OK. I'm sure you've, I've seen I just have to follow you on Twitter. I, you, you go out and enjoy a lot of places. It looks like it's good. Good to see. Well, you know, dining out to help out. If I, yeah. Taking one for the team. right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's talk for a moment about uh, as we go to wrap this up, let's talk about public spaces. So on June 9th, 2021, more green space was approved for the Fairview neighborhood. And you know what I'm talking about? I do. OK, so tell us about that. Um, Super exciting, uh, which is creation of a new permanent park, a uh, block long park between uh, Fifth and Six and Fir and Pine in the Fairview neighborhood. Okay. Um, and the city has been acquiring land um, in that block, taken the three plus decades, best part of 40 years to do that, because um, it can take a while to assemble that land. Um, yeah. We launched a pop up park on one corner. If you go down there, you can see there's a pollinator garden and there's a cool mural that has a bee on it. But basically, that entire block now has been acquired. Uh, with the exception of one small parcel. So it can now be turned into a permanent green space and a legacy park for the city, which is super exciting, but really important because we have a goal to have 0.6 hectares of park space, or it's actually 1.1 hectares of park space per thousand people in the city. Um, and Fairview was a park deficient neighborhood. It only has 0.6 hectares. So mm. I think we've all seen during the pandemic how important it is to be able to get outside to our mental health, physical health, well-being. Um, you know, you take your dog, you meet your neighbors, right? Yeah. You're socializing outside. Um, and just kind of enjoying being next to nature. So those are legacy um, actions that will extend for generations. And not only did the city acquire that land, but the decision that council took this week was to designate it as a permanent public park, which means that it protects it from development pressures. Okay. And so you're permanently putting that green space in. And so imagine as your city densifies and people are living in smaller spaces, they don't have their own backyards, it just becomes more and more, more critical. And more so I'm super yeah. passionate about this topic, as you can probably yeah. tell. Yeah. But if you hadn't had the foresight to create that kind of green space, imagine what Vancouver would be like if Stanley Park was not Stanley Park. Yeah. What if that had been developed, for example? Right? Yeah, what if terrible. you didn't have those? And you're never going to get those large swaths of green space back. It takes, it, they're all developed now. Yeah. It takes a long time to acquire them. So it is, I think, incredibly exciting. It looks, you know, the report looks a bit dry on paper, but when you think about what it really means. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a big deal. Yeah. Oh, that's exciting. Now, uh, to, to finish up here, your um, your first term, I mean, this is your second term in municipal politics, but your first term as city councilor, you did run under the NPA and you got elected on the NPA, but you and your and I think two of your other colleagues have decided to leave the NPA, maybe temporarily, maybe permanently, um, but you're currently sitting as an independent. Um, first of all, just for the record, are you going to run in the next election? Great question. Um, yeah. I haven't made the final decision. Um, okay. I didn't know I was going to be in politics at all, and I didn't know yeah. I was going to be a city councillor. So, um, you know, we have a year and a half to go until yeah, then. Yeah, it's quite a bit of time. Yeah, it's been a pandemic. So we, we've got kind of a few major issues um, yeah. in front of us. Um, the MPA started originally with five elected councillors. Four have left now. Yeah. So there's only one remaining MPA councillor, and we all did So that, that must say a lot about what's going on with the... I Think the it's, board and I think it's pretty significant yeah. um, for four of your electeds to make that decision um, yeah. sends a big signal. And I think we felt we all needed to do that um, in order to kind of just focus on doing the job, honestly, and not that you got elected for that we got elected for um, yeah. and, and not be distracted by sort of, you know, all the issues that are coming up with the board and all of those distractions yeah. uh, that are happening. So um, I think it's a good decision. I think we all felt it was the right thing to do in the right time. And I think we're all kind of focused on just doing the job now and then figuring out how that political landscape shakes out sure. come October 2022. You know, statistically speaking, running as an independent, which I love the concept because I love meeting people like you and hearing your individual thoughts because I feel like parties 
um, um, they they sour individual thought for a party agenda. Yeah. So um, I actually like that we got a bunch of independents now, and I hope you all run again. Um, but it's statistically, it's really hard to get elected as an ind- as an independent. So if you were to run again, do you think you'd run as an independent, or you think you'd probably align with a, a, a either a legacy party or a new party? It's a great question. Vancouver, you're right, has historically had a party system, um, and that's what people have used to navigate the really long municipal ballots. Um, you know, yeah, if you go there, remember long. how long they are? I think there were 71 candidates for council last time. Yeah. So not easy to research all the candidates and, and do that. Um, so I think we're just going to have to assess whether or not there's more of a willingness for people to support electives now, or if it makes sense to sort of perhaps support each other. Um, and maybe that looks like an alliance of like-minded candidates. Right. Um, who knows? But I think there's going to be a, you know, a, a week is a long time in politics. I think there's going to yeah. be a fair amount of change between now and then. Yeah. Well, we had Ken Sim on here about, um, I guess it was maybe like a month and a half ago. And of course, he's been part of this movement of a new ABC. It's a better city. Yeah. I told him that some of the comments were it's a always be closing party. <laughs> if you ever watched Glengarry Glen Ross. Um, last item is tolls for downtown core. So the 2018 report by the Mobility Pricing Independence Commission, I gotta wonder how many tax dollars are spent on that, suggested that a toll would be the most effective tool to reduce regional congestion. So my question is, um, will a toll to def- uh, will a toll divide our city economically? First of all, I guess, actually first question would be, do you support tolls going into downtown Vancouver and whether you do or you don't, do you think it's going to divide our, our city economically? So I did not support when this vote came up at council uh, to move forward with um, transport pricing and, and looking at a model. I did not support this um, at this time in this way for the city of Vancouver. The study that you referred to was a Metro Vancouver study. And okay. part of the challenge that I have is that Vancouver is looking to do its own thing. Um, and to go it alone, which doesn't make sense. You want to have a regional perspective. It's like when we had the discussion around ride hailing. And Vancouver wanted to go it alone and issue its own licenses. And I'm like, okay, that doesn't make sense to me because somebody comes in to enjoy the Granville Entertainment District. They probably artificially don't live in one area. They have to cross a boundary and they need to get home. And that's the issue we have late at night without having transportation to get people home. So same thing, right? People are permeable, right? They cross boundaries when Mm -hmm. they're working. They're in the service industry, right? They live in a suburb. They come into Vancouver, so on, right? So it doesn't make sense to me not to do it um, without a regional approach. Um, We also have a pandemic. We have a downtown that's on its knees um, that has 15% of people working in office buildings, massive drop in foot traffic, retail closures, um, and a number of other issues. The other challenges that I had with the proposal were, number one, Vancouver does not actually have the legal authority to toll. So the city staff report is proposing that we put hundreds of thousands of dollars into developing this model and this study. We actually don't have the ability to do it. The then city manager at the time when I asked about the logistics, I said, well, how would you do it? Because legally we can't unless we ask for the permission or an exemption from the province was, well, perhaps we'll use an app. So I'm like, okay, okay so we're not going to use cameras. We're going to utilize an app. We don't know what that looks like. We don't have the legal ability to do this. This seems very fraught. Um, also, the other issue that I had was they said, well, okay, this will make alternative transportation options better, right? Can people have better options for transit, right? We'll have better road infrastructure, better space for people. I said, okay, is any of the money going to go into transit, into either enhanced capacity, new service? No. So the city was proposing that it would implement a model, collect the revenue, and spend the revenue, perhaps on some street enhancements, perhaps on some additional um, bike capacity, perhaps on enabling things like micromobility. But it didn't make sense to me that you were going to offer up the option being things like alternative transportation, but not actually put the dollars into that. And you sure. can have the legal ability to do it. Not to mention that it's an extra cost right now for people. Um, there's a lot of equity issues um, in terms of people that are service providers. So you think of home care workers. Sure. Um, what about, and I think it actually could hurt people that are being most hit by the affordability crisis because if you live in a single family home, you probably have a garage. You probably have the ability to park off your street because the city's also talking about street parking and permit parking, right? So if you're the person that doesn't have access to that, you're going to get hit it, yeah. with parking costs. So I didn't think it was well thought out, well articulated. What we proposed was 
refer this into the discussion with Metro Vancouver and have that broader regional conversation, right, about what mobility looks like in the region and how people move. Um, mm -hmm. But that wasn't that was defeated at council. This is these are great answers. Like you're so pragmatic, Sarah. I don't. I mean, I guess I'm kind of trying to figure out like why are the other city councillors not able to just think so logically. I mean, this is. I don't know. I, I don't know. Like you, <laughs> you, you might want to like, have is... you might want to have them on, and you know, I'm have some to. have some good conversations and kind yeah. of ask their perspectives, you know, on, on issues because you know everybody brings different ones to the table. I can only yeah. kind of speak for mine, right? Yeah, sure. Well, you've spoken really well. This is great. Well, normally I would finish off by saying because we, are, you know, we are a bit of a ways from a con uh, from a uh, contest, uh, a, another election. Um, but normally I'd ask uh, how people can get involved. Um, but you're not, you haven't decided whether you're going to run yet or not. I think it'd be great to have you run again. So there's my vote. Um, it, it is a privilege to do the job. Yeah. Like at the end, at the end of the day, it's one of those moments in time where you feel pretty lucky you get to do it, right? Well, I can see, I can see as I follow you on social media, and now that I've spoken to you, that you obviously are a very passionate Vancouverite and uh, city councilor. And this has been great. I really appreciate being on the show today. So, Sarah Kirby Young, city councilor with the city of Vancouver. Thank you for being on the show today. Thanks for being on Coastal Front. Thanks for having me.